So everybody, please welcome Hannah Miller. Hannah Miller grew up in a circus, literally, but after 20 years of performing and managing and directing and juggling all the hats, she decided it's time to run away and join the real world. Today, Hannah is a leadership coach and consultant, combining her unique background as a ringmaster with a bone deep passion for leadership. She supports leaders and teams at all stages of their development, helping them to step confidently into the spotlight and unleash their superstar potential. So with that, I will shut up and I will turn it over to Hannah. Awesome, thank you so much. Let me get this shared, okay. Oh, can y'all see the the pink person walking? Yes, and not my slot, not my presenter view. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for having me here today. This is really exciting. I didn't know about Creative Mornings, but I'm so glad to, and I look forward to more. I've watched a bunch of the recordings, and I also want to give a special thank you and shout out to all my friendly faces in the crowd. Thank you. I see you names and faces, and I appreciate it. So. I love this word. I thought it was really fun. I understood why they selected me for this um, topic, but when I started researching the word divergent, I found that I was really inspired and just lit up by it. And so some of the definitions that really resonated with me is this idea of differing from a common standard, deviating from your familiar path, becoming different, and moving away from what's expected. But there was this surprising definition that, um, that I discovered, and that's in mathematics, which is having no finite limit or without limit. And I think that that is just a really magical idea with divergent, and we'll come back to a little bit later on. So obviously my upbringing is what brought me to meet all of you. But when I started thinking about it, I realized that I actually have a long family legacy of following a divergent path. My great grandmother, Ruth Hannah McCormick Sims was, um, was a, a, one of the first women in Congress. She was first woman elected at, for, to a statewide office in Illinois. Um, and she, she was just a notable 20th century, early 20th century politician. And she broke rules and barriers left, right, and center. She was instrumental in women's suffrage. And she, you could learn all about her on Wikipedia if you want. But one anecdote that I came across recently that I was really proud of and excited about was that when most suffragists abandoned their black colleagues after 1920, Ruth recruited an African-American pioneer named Mary Church Terrell to head her 1929 Illinois campaign for Senate. Um, and that's just one tiny example of how she diverged from what everybody else was doing. Her daughter, my grandmother, Basie Tankersley, if you're a Tucson person, you probably heard of Basie because she lived here for a long time. She grew up in the family business of newspapers and politics, and she was once actually known as the crown princess of the Chicago Tribune Empire because it was her uncle's paper. And he sent her to run the Washington Times Herald but after she did that for a while, she decided that she did not want to pursue the family business and she wanted a life with more autonomy. So she left and pursued her passion, which was breeding Arabian horses. And she was so successful at it. She became the largest breeder in the United States and one of the most recognized and celebrated Arabian horse breeders in the world. My father, her son, started out his career in the various family businesses. He grew up on a horse farm. He worked in the newspapers. He tried breeding Arabian horses. And finally, he said, you know, I think I want to start a circus. So that's where I grew up in a, the dinner theater in Orlando, Florida, that he and my mom started that featured 65 horses. And it was this very divergent idea. There's just not anything like that in Florida or many places in the world. And it became one of the most famous, longest running equestrian performance venues in the world. And for 25 years, there was one show, at least one show, sometimes three shows every single day. And more than 20 million people came through the doors. One quick caveat, because there are people here who know the truth of this, we did actually close a couple times, but that was only because a hurricane came through Orlando and shut down the road we were on. So we couldn't have a show, but we all spent the night and hung out with the horses. So a couple of pictures from my childhood. This is the original cast photo. The show was called Arabian Nights. Um, and my whole family is in this. I, I don't know if you can see. Can you all see my cursor? 
Josh, you're the only one. Okay, so this is my dad in the insane yellow and pink and me and my sister. And this is my mom and this is my godfather and his first wife. And that will become his second wife later on. And I can't see all the rest of the faces, but uh, it was our big happy circus family. A um, couple photos of me performing. I, most of my performing was done in the pre-digital photo age, so I actually don't have tons of them, but one of the skills I learned in circus, I can ride a quadrille with royal lipizzans. So this is me right here staring at the camera when everyone else is looking ahead. Um, and my other really great skill is I can square dance on horses, and I am very accomplished at equestrian square dancing, which is a totally not helpful skill in the real world. <laughs> And then later on when I was directing the show, this is kind of what it looked like. And I actually designed most of the costumes in this layout. I took about half the photos and I also creative directed the materials that led to this piece. So that was kind of the show. That's the life that I grew up in. But and running a circus was challenging for different reasons than I think you'd expect. What seems impossible is handling all the moving parts. But because I grew up with it, that part was always really natural to me. And the challenge I encountered was that everywhere I looked, I saw room for improvement in how things were done, but I didn't have the language for it because I hadn't studied it. I didn't know this was a field. And so my ideas were often met with a lot of resistance. Uh, that didn't stop me. It was my family business and I would push through with the changes that I thought were really necessary. And I managed to restructure almost every aspect of the business during my tenure in management, which included the financial crash in um, 2008, when we had to cut our budget by almost a third. Um, and we managed to improve every metric while we did that. So the successful change always came with a cost though. And eventually I realized that I needed to find my own divergent path and leave the world that I knew. And I imagine I am not the only person here who has set out on a lonely road. And when you leave the only life you've known, it's not usually because things are going really well. Um, so uh, I imagine some folks here can relate to this experience and you probably um, know, as I learned, that when you find yourself out wandering, looking for the path that's yours and yours alone, it can take a while, but eventually you realize that the reasons that you had to leave, the truths about how you see the world that so conflicted with the people around you, those aren't your weaknesses. They're your strengths. They're the source of the intrinsic motivation to find your own divergent path and follow it, even when the path is lonely. And it's a quality that's inherent to leaders, in my experience, um, that they feel this pull to move away from what's expected and deviate and become different because great leadership is divergent. Eventually, I found myself studying the field of leadership and organizational development. And one of the things that I learned there is that, and this is actually, this quote is from a book that I'm launching a book club with. Um, it's called Nonsense, The Power of Not Knowing. But the highest performing companies often have more in common with humiliated bankrupts than they do with companies that merely survive. Firms that go bust have the same characteristics as firms that go gangbusters. And so the opposite of sky high success isn't failure, but mediocrity. And what leaders who achieve wild success or abysmal failure have in common is that they follow their diver the divergent path that they're called to. And while nobody wants to pursue failure, if you lead from a place of fear of failure, that is to, that dooms you to tread the path of mediocrity. But our culture really loves to focus on the idea that we need to fix our weaknesses rather than encourage and follow our unique divergent path. So who here has heard on a personal note, whether from a boss or a teacher or other authority figure, okay, over here we have the stuff that you're good at, so we don't need to talk about that. Let's focus instead on all this stuff that you're bad at because that feels wonderful and is helpful. Yeah, that's a really common um, approach that we have and we're encouraged by our culture to be well-rounded individuals, right? We hear this all the time, we be more well-rounded. So we work to overcome our weaknesses through long effort and force of will and try and, and fit ourselves into this round hole. But the truth is that when we spend the majority of our energy and effort working to be more organized or make decisions faster or embrace conflict or whatever things are just inherently uncomfortable for us, we get hung up on this idea of weakness fixing. We close ourselves off from the opportunity that comes when we embrace our unique divergent talents. And those talents are the source of our power and edge. They're what set us apart and make us different. And they're the key to unlocking our weaknesses too. 
which isn't to say, you know, we shouldn't ignore our weaknesses. We need to hack our brains to give us the ability to overcome our obstacles using our talents. So I have an example of this is something I'm doing right now. Um, I am not a naturally organized or detail oriented person. Like I writing something down on a list is a sure way to clutter up my desk with papers I never look at. Um, so I, but I realized that I need to manage projects and I need a CRM. Um, so I, I found a new software that does both of those things. And what works about it for me is that it ties people to the tasks because my talents are really focused on relationship building and on influencing people. And credibility is my cornerstone, like being living up to my word and forming strong relationships based on trust and credibility motivates me to do everything. So by, by meshing these two things, I'm using my talents and my, that motivate me to do the things that I am not typically motivated to do because I'm constantly reminded of how being organized and following through is impacting my credibility. So the, when we invest in our unique divergent talents, we build them into strengths. And when we do that, we, um, this is how we find the limitless path through the strengths that make us different from everyone else. And that's where I really, I just thought, I was like, yes, limitless is what we all have the ability to achieve when we embrace what makes us divergent. So, for me, I had to leave the circus to figure out how to embrace what made me unique. And through that process, I accepted the, that the need to be divergent is in my blood and it's my calling to help others find their spotlight and build the confidence to step into it. And believe it or not, I had to leave the circus to become a ringmaster. And that is all I've got. Exit, end, share. Somehow I could do that. I gotta switch desktop, sorry. Nope, where are you? I can't stop. Oh, there it is, stop share. Yay, okay, there's all the people, howdy. So that's the end of my prepared remarks. I would love to continue this in conversational fashion though. Awesome, thank you. And we'll have uh, Emily facilitate a Q and A with everyone. So if you have a question to ask, uh, you can drop it in the chat or raise your hand. Oh yeah, I see somebody went to somebody's been to Arabian Nights. I love when that I love when I meet people. Han, Han, Hannah, I went to Arabian Nights like as a teen and I have a picture of me and my friend in front of the, you know, where you take the picture. Like yeah, it, yeah I loved it. And I'm that's like, awesome. oh my God, that's yeah. What and year I'm, about was that? Roughly. I was probably like 13 or 14, um, maybe like 30 years ago or so. Like, has it been it's been a long time? It's been, yeah, it's been closed for almost 10 years now. Okay, so yeah, like maybe 30 years ago, maybe or something? <laughs> That's, uh, I, I can't do the math. Or 20? Yeah, yeah, yeah. in the 90s. I would have been performing yes. in the 90s. Oh, yeah. no way! Yeah. That's so cool. Oh, my gosh. Yay. Thanks for being here. What questions do we have? I have one for you, Hannah. Yeah, hey, Ashley. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for joining this morning. It's always a pleasure to hear your story. Uh, so thank, thank you. you. Uh, I want to know, have you ever had a moment where there was true danger, where you may have almost hurt yourself and there was a close call or save? Do you have any of those moments uh, where it was just, wow, I'm happy I turned a little bit to the left or right because I could have hurt myself or someone else. Oh Anything yeah. Ever happen? Oh, totally. I mean, it's impossible not to when you're doing a show with 60 horses every day. Um, I, the thing I was always most afraid of was that my horse was going to fall with me. And then one day it happened. So you know, we had this footing called Fibar, this like wood chips. And when we put new Fibar in, it was like riding on ice. Like it was just slippery. Um, and we took a sharp turn and his feet started to go out from under him. And time slowed down. Like it was totally one of those moments where literally I can remember every nanosecond of that. I was like, oh, well, he's going to fall down. I should probably get my leg out of the way. Let me just take my foot out of the stirrup and move it. And he went down and I stood up and got back on and we were fine. It wasn't totally not, a, I mean, my horse was also wonderful and took very good care of me and probably slowed it down on purpose. But we definitely, um, one, we had a lot of, you know, we had some major injuries that happened. And one time, we had a performer who fell and got a concussion during the show. And she was scheduled to be the princess later on who rode the black stallion 
with no saddle, no bridle in satin pants at a dead gallop. Like it was just an insane thing. And so it's not like something a lot of people can do. And we, luckily one of the other performers who could do that was there watching the show with her son who was you know, a toddler at the time. She's like, can somebody watch my kids so that I can go be the princess real quick? I think you might need a princess. Um, but thank you, good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Does anyone else? Jen, I think you might have had a, a question on your mind earlier. There's one in the chat if you want to do that one first, and then yeah, I've got one. Oh, great. Thank you. So it looks like Beth has a question. Did you want me to read it or do you? No, or I got it. How do your circus skills influence my work today? Um, definitely my willingness to like go out in front of people and the enjoyment of you know, finding, finding a figurative spotlight. Um, as you may be able to tell, it influences my makeup pretty heavily. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, in this, one of the things that was really true is that, so when you have a, something happen, you know, the show must go on as a real thing when you're in show business. And so no matter what just happened, you know, somebody got injured or a costume got destroyed, or, you know, one time we had the Conestoga wagon broke in half and we had to literally go and carry it out of the ring. Um, you, you have to figure out how are you gonna continue with the show? And so there can be, you know, 90 seconds and you have to rewrite the whole ending so that everything gets out the curtain. And so that's something that definitely comes up for me and my talents reflect that um, and my strengths that I'm highly adaptable. And in moments of chaos, I'm, I really thrive. Like, so when things, when, other, when clients are really overwhelmed or dealing with overwhelming situations, I have a knack for seeing the, the path through. I'm like, how are we gonna sort this out so that it can, um, so that it can be effective um, and we can get out of chaos and back into a place of effective work. Oops. Was my family supportive when I chose to take my own path out of the family business? Did it take time? It did take time. I will tell you when I left, I told my dad, because my dad and I, we had been best friends. Like my first year of college, when I moved away, I talked to him for an hour every single day and then transferred back to be closer to home. Because this is, you know, we were just thick as thieves. And as my boss, he was just impossible. Like I couldn't do it. So I told him when we left town, I was like, you know, I really miss my dad because he was a really great part of my life. But my boss is a real asshole and I don't want to talk to him right now. So <laughs> he was very respectful of it. And he would, you know, he, he was you know, he was generous and kind and patient and we rebuilt slowly and now we're really good friends again and even collaborating on something which I swore I would never do but it's going well he's very happy to let me be in charge which is kind of the that's how it has to be for us to work together as long as I'm in charge I can work with him. Uh, John has a question there. Oh, John, uh, skills I have gained from, since diverging from the circus that I wish I'd had. Oh, gosh, I wish I'd had while living and working. So when I studied organizational development in my master's program, I learned that I have great instincts for organizational development. I had no idea this was a field and there, were this, there was science and you could study this and follow best practices. But everything I learned... I had already done. So I really wish I had known that you could like hire a consultant to come in and help you and, and tell you how things work, like how to, how to do organizational change because having overcoming the, the, the you know, gain, regaining confidence in my instincts was probably the hardest thing I had to do after leaving. Um, and that really helped a lot. Like learning that leadership and organizational development are things that I, love and am good at. And I think everybody should do what they love and they're good at. That's how you do great work. Um, but while my staff always appreciated that, and I'm still, I'm still collaborating, honestly, with some of the people that I worked with in the circus, um, my dad wanted to run it his way. And, it, you know, it closed a few years after I left and he apologized for how we fell out. And, um, and he's like, and if you'd stayed, we'd still be open. And then COVID hit and we were both really glad it was closed. We're like feeding 65 horses in a pandemic is not something we want to have to worry about. So thank you, great, great question. Hey Hannah, um, yeah. my question, well, I had a couple in my mind, but then when you were talking about something you said um, in your talk was if something, I might not get it quite right, but if you're leading from the place of fear, it leads to mediocrity. How would you say that in the positive? I've thought about that a lot. Like. 
like back, I think Julie and I used to talk about this, like taking when we were freelancing, like taking clients from a place of fear, but how would you say that in the positive? And can you talk a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. I say when you, I mean, when you lead from a place of curiosity and, um, and an energy maybe is the right word. Like it's kind of confidence. It's kind of like when you lead from a place of authenticity, that's what I'm going to say. Um, you, whether you succeed or fail, you are learning valuable things about yourself. And so because you're, 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 you're going to create the work that you authentically want to do. Whereas if you're coming from a place of fear, you're going to wind up doing, you're going to wind up too busy to do the work that's really important to who you are as a person. So yeah, leading from a place of authenticity is, is, it's, it's at least how I'm doing it. It's working so well. It's working well so far. Great. Thank you. I, I had, been kind of picking at the word confidence, but I like authenticity a lot. So thank you. Confidence is hard um, it come because it's it's so fragile, you know, and it's so easily derailed. Oh, hey, Kathy. Um, and um, and 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 if you don't feel like when you're not feeling confident, that doesn't mean you can't act from a place of authenticity. Like you can do that even when it's scary, um, because it's it's the good kind of scary. It's the walk towards, not walk away from kind of scary. But thank you. That's a really cool question. I have another one if nobody else has questions. Go ahead, Jen. All right, I'm going to go. Um, I think you kind of touched on this, but when did you realize your unique background really gave you a skill set that set you apart in the so-called real world? Yeah, um, I was really fortunate to find a pair of consultants who uh, they adopted me mostly because I made them, partly because I made them. We had, they they recognized right away, they worked in nonprofits and they're like, oh, you ran a circus, you can totally work in nonprofits. <laughs> and so they were doing a bunch of executive searches and they kept sending me on interviews and I kept coming in second, which is, was frustrating at the time and I was so happy about long-term. And the third time I went to an interview, I didn't even know, they're like, oh, you should meet this person. And I went and found out it was an interview. So that was a fun experience. But I left that and I went to their office and I said, I really appreciate this, but I don't want to work for them because I will get fired because I need to do things the way I know they're right. And, and this is, I just know I won't work well in this situation. I want to do what you do. You come in, you solve a problem and you leave and people come to you for your expertise. That sounds amazing. And they said, well, we love you, but we don't have capacity to hire somebody right now. We're, you know, small independent people. And I said, well, I'm bored and unemployed. And unless you lock the door, I'm going to start showing up until I'm indispensable. And I bet you, you'll hire me. And within three months, they hired me full time. And I spent a few years with them and they really, they helped develop my confidence. And, you know, I remember one of the first events I went to with Laura, I was like, well, you know, I don't know if you want my opinion, but you know, I, you know, do you want me to weigh in? She's like, Hannah, you're a consultant now. You should have more opinions. And I was like, oh, really? This is my perfect job. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I did Greater Tucson Leadership and, you know, finding the field of leadership helped and, and finding more people like me and connecting and just building relationships and seeing how that, um, how I grew and how other people grew. And they tended to give me all the really difficult clients too. Like they, you know, I, I don't care how scary somebody in your office is, they're not a lion tamer and they're not my dad. So I don't really like, I, I once had to coach a guy named Bear who intimidated the crap out of him. They're like, you're getting Bear. I'm like, I, I will take Bear. That would be fine for me. Um, so, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not easily intimidated by, uh, by high, high drama people. So now that you have the ability uh, to, to curate your curiosity and opinions, um, Beth asked, uh, who is your perfect client now? Yes. Oh, that's a really great question. A lot of them here <laughs> um, in the in the group today. Um, I my perfect clients want to be more themselves, and 
need, need a collaborator and a confidant. You know, that's the role that I most love to serve. And I work with teams and help them understand each other better. But like my, I really love working with a whole leadership team where I work one-on-one -on -one and I work with them as a group so that I can help them personally develop their confidence and their skills and their strengths and problem solve and be there like, oh crap, I don't know what to do. Like we have this problem and we're overwhelmed because we have all this work to do. And, and I can just be like, well, how about this? Here's a couple options. Um, but yeah, I love to work with other people who care about knowing themselves and are curious about who they are and, and who they, and conscious about who they want to become. Uh, Stephanie asked a really great question, <clears throat> which is, uh, what is a skill or perspective you wish more non-circus people had? Oh, yes, that is a really good one. Thank you. Um, that, that perfect is the enemy of good, you know, that a, a good enough jo job done today is better than a perfect job done never. You know, the show, the show happens every day, you know, you're talking about 10 to 14 shows a week, sometimes even more than that. You can't, you can't beat yourself up when it falls a little bit short. The audience doesn't know. Like maybe that's one of the things is the audience doesn't know what perfect looks like. The audience knows whether they are enjoying the experience. And so don't, when you get, when you fall into the hole of beating yourself up and trying and, and noticing how you are failing to be perfect, you miss connecting with the audience and the connection is what matters. And we eventually actually got to a philosophy that we adopted where we said we would rather have energetic young people with, with little skill and lots of talent who love this job and who are out there having fun and having a great connection with each other. We can teach them more skills, but divas who have all the special unique skills in the world and are making everybody miserable, they hurt the show. They don't help it. Like your superstar performer that you have to walk on eggshells around, gone. They are not helping your show, no matter how special they think they are and how special they tell you they are. Your show, whatever your show is, it's better when everybody there loves being there and wants to pull together. Fantastic questions. Thank you. all Yeah, that's a beautiful statement. I, I feel like um, it sort of hits on that idea of, um, the imperfect being absolutely perfect, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. So John asked a question, what do you miss most and also least about working slash living in the circus? Yeah, good questions, John. Um, so I miss most, I mean, the applause, like it's, it really is like whether you are actively in the show, in the spotlight, hearing the applause, or if you're among the crowd, but you know, you're part of it, like there is, there is just an energy when the audience is in love with, with the moment um, and knowing that you're a part of that moment. That is, you know, that's, that's hard to find elsewhere. You know, like that's not something you get to like experience, especially when it's part of a team, you know, like if I speak or if I do something and people applaud for me, that's less fun for me than it was. My favorite thing was to ride in finale where we have all these horses carrying flags and we, you know, we do this thing and, and then we all stand together and even the servers would come out and stand in front of us and we would take the applause for the entirety of the show and for the for the being together. So like the the working together as a team to create something magical is probably the thing I miss the most. Um, what do I miss least? Um, I don't know, three hour conversations with diva performers in the middle of the night who keep to try and convince them to do something obvious, like <laughs> long conversation. No, no, you're important. You're important. No, that the people aren't disrespecting you. Those, I don't miss those conversations. <laughs> um, Jen asked an amazing question. Do you ever have imposter syndrome or recommendations for how to handle that? <laughs> I absolutely do, definitely. And I actually, I read a book by Amanda Palmer called The Art of Asking, which is a really fun book and very easy to read because she writes in like little tiny, like a paragraph or two. So you can totally read for five minutes and put it back down. Um, but she called it, um, she calls it the fraud police instead of imposter syndrome. And I really love that. And I have adopted it and I'm trying to use it more because imposter syndrome 
the problem I have with it is it makes it sound like something is wrong with me. Like I have a flaw that I have this imposter syndrome. The fraud police, that's an external shits that I don't have to listen to. Like fraud police, make your noise. I'm not listening. Like, okay, yes, you're a thing that happens and I can ignore, but it's outside of me. It's not inside of me. So that's been my biggest help in terms of, because yeah, we're all, we're all going to be afraid of stuff sometimes. And a lot of times fear is a, is, is telling you something valuable that you should do, but um, but yeah, impossible. Like, and also embrace your strengths, man. Like I do, I have an assessment that I took that was life altering for me. I took it as part of GTL. It's the Clifton Strengths Assessment or Strengths Finder, and I read it and I went, "You mean I'm allowed to be these things? These are good. Th- these are not things I have to keep under control. Like all my strengths." were things that I had really consciously tried to contain my whole life. And, you know, I read the like basements of my strengths and they said, you're a know-it-all, show-off blabbermouth. And everybody in the room was looking at their basements going, oh no, I need to correct these. And I was like, yeah, okay. If you want to not like me for being a know-it-all, show-off blabbermouth, that's probably a good reason. How about I go find a job where that's useful? Um, So now I'm here doing this and I love it and it's fun. Um, But yeah, just, just knowing yourself and seeing your talent as your superpower, not as something that you need to contain and overcome. Because um, I think there's a lot, you know, when they're, when we're young and they come out in this really raw fashion, we hear from everybody like less of that. I mean, especially people conditioned female in the world, but I think everybody to some degree hears like, oh no, tone that down. And usually the the things you got that message about are the things that now as an adult, you want to crank up and, and, you know, you don't want to blow the speakers, but you do want to like tune things to that frequency because that's your magic. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's my overcoming imposter syndrome is embrace the things, you know, um, Cat Williams has this great stand up bit from years ago called the Pimp Chronicles. And he has this whole bit about how a hater's job is to hate. So why would you want them not to hate? Like, come on, like you, you should, if you've got five haters, you should set yourself a goal to have 12 by Christmas because th- that's what their job is. We want to, we want to let them do their job. If you don't have any haters, you are clearly doing something wrong in your life. So uh, those are the kind of things. I've Thank heard. you for quoting Cat Williams this morning. <laughs> I needed that. Thank you. <laughs> Pimp Chronicles. I, love them so much. I know the Pimp Chronicles are amazing. It's like one of the great stand-up routines ever. <laughs> um, I love Hannah's statement here where she says applause is direct and immediate feedback. Um, what are your feelings on that? Absolutely. Yeah. And the you can tell by the, the tone of the applause. There's so much, you know, the energy of the clapping and, and there's, there is so much and it gives you it's a relationship, you know, it's that direct and immediate feedback, but it also, so that you can respond to it and, um, and you can find ways to give more or ask more. And yeah, it's a, it's a conversation. So yeah, I totally agree with that. That's a fabulous statement. Thank you. I love your, your continuing to, you know, equate many of those emotions to energy. Um, because I really believe that that's what that exchange is about, whether it be that courage that you were talking about earlier, or the authenticity, and in this case, it's the conversation, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jen asked or <laughs> said, equestrian square dancing, what's a way that some of the more unexpected skills have translated to your current work? Mm. I mean, honestly, like, I know this is like trite, but it took me a long time to be okay doing show makeup in the real world. Like I was like, that was something that for a long time, I actually remembered, I was talking to a friend that was chatting with her this morning. And I remember that when I left Florida, I was in such rough shape at the time that I was like, I, I don't know how to do makeup. Will you go shopping with me and help me? And I remember asking her, I'm like, do people even wear blush? Is that a thing? And like, like I had totally forgotten, like I was, eight when I started performing, 11 when I worked my first 40 hour week in makeup. And um, so thank you, Hannah. I like that you're another Hannah with a one H. Oh, yay. Um, so that was something that I was like, another one of those confidence things where I'm like, oh, this is this is authentic to me. Even if it's different than everybody else, it's okay for me to, to occupy that space. Um, unexpected skills. I mean, you work until the work is done. 
is something, you know, like, and you do whatever the work is. And I think that really, you know, I, I did a lot of sweeping growing up and I love sweeping. I love coiling a hose, honestly. And there's a, there's a beautiful joy because you got to water the horses every night and like coiling the hose back up. It's a, it's a nice moment, like leaving it right for the next day. Um, and I think that really helped, you know, that's what led me to show up at these consultants office and be like, I'm not leaving unless you make me because, I, and I'll just do whatever, like I'll do your email list. And I was just there like gal Friday for a, at least a year. I just shadowed them on everything. I typed notes, like I got the coffee. It was not, um, I was, I thought of it as an apprenticeship because in horses and in circus, that's how you learn is you apprentice, you go and you do whatever work somebody needs and they, and you learn from it and they give you knowledge and they give you confidence. Um, so I think, I think that just the, like, there is no work that doesn't matter. Um, it's fine to, you know, there's no, there's somebody I know who doesn't like to do work, quote, a monkey could do. And it drives me bonkers. I'm like, no, all the work is important. A monkey doing uh, that a monkey could do, it does not mean you shouldn't. Um, so yeah, you do the work in front of you. Um, that's really served me well. Uh, um. Julie asks, uh, what are your top five strengths from the assessment? My top five are ideation, strategic, communication, in adaptability, and individualization. Hannah, yeah. that being said, uh, it made me think about right now during the pandemic, I have, communi or I have um, communication with you, but I'm also woo, includer, empathy. And one thing I'm, I'm struggling with during this pandemic is being such a people person. Yeah. And it seems like you are too. How are you coping this past year with like, you know, your job helping others and just like keeping that up? Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. I definitely spent the first few months kind of lonely. I knit, I knitted a lot in the first few months. Like that's kind of what I do when I'm a little depressed and I'm happy with that. It's a good coping skill. Um, so, but then my breakfast club that I'm part of met and I had this really productive day and I thought, I think people might be important to me. You know, I obviously already knew. I'm like, oh, people, that's how I get productive. And so I, I extrapolated from that, that I was probably not the only leader I knew who was feeling lonely. And, um, I did some focus groups and then I piloted something and I created this new thing. That's this small group coaching for making new connections. They're called synergy circles. And there's usually only five people, you know, four to six people in a group. They're from different industries, different backgrounds, different levels of experience. And we make new connections and we just get together and talk about a leadership topic. Um, and the pilot group was personally transformational for me. Um, I, and everyone in it, we all kind of had these huge leaps of growth as humans. Um, and we're all still meeting. And I'm in the third round of it now and they are going just beautifully as there's a few people here who I hope would agree. Um, but yeah, so I found a way to build new networks, new connections, new circles. Uh, but I, I respect you, my woo is like 12. It's like, it's my first off the bench, right? Like I can call on woo, much to my husband's chagrin. I will talk to somebody in a grocery store about what melon to pick all day long. He's like, why are we, now she's gonna talk to us in the frozen section. I'm like, yep, yeah, that'll be fun. Um, and, but it's, it's a bench player for me. So I don't, woo high, I can imagine is a struggle. Um, I, I think woo's my number one. So I, oh. I, I'm sure my fiance feels the same way. Like, do you have to talk to everybody? In every elevator, <laughs> on every plane. Um, yeah, I would find, I mean, there's some like drop-in networking groups. I would find yourself, you know, search on LinkedIn, like search on some Facebook groups and try and and put it out there or also go through your Rolodex and be like, hey, I'm lonely for connection and I would like to talk to people. Would you like to talk to me and set up random Zooms? I do that too. I'm like, I haven't talked to you in a year. I'm trying not to lose connection. Oh, that's cool. What's your website again too? We'll put it in the- Oh um, yeah, it's yeah. masteryourcircus.com. Okay. Um, so one last question I think that we have time for yeah. um, from Maggie. And uh, that is, do you feel you would have taken a similar path in life had you not had such a divergent slash different childhood and history with the circus? Interesting. Very good question. Do you have context time, Maggie? Do we know this yet? Uh, <laughs> um, 
I mean, I think yes, in many ways. Um, if, if, you know, if my parents hadn't started a circus, I still am from a family that values eccentricity very highly. And so there was a lot about that that was challenging as a young person. I did not, the first time I ever was in a group of people, I felt like were my peers, I was 35. And I still have a hard time. I honestly, I, I observed a college class this week and like, it zapped my brain and I like all my insecurities from being 20 came back because I was so not cool in high school and college. Like I just did not know how to communicate with other people my age. Um, so I think I probably would have, you know, my, nobody in my family knows how to communicate <laughs> well with people. Um, so I think there's a decent chance that I would have, um, I would have wound up doing something leadery like that's something that we that was instilled in me there were a lot of lessons early on that I got from my dad about about leadership you know make it if you if there's a difficult situation that comes up the worst thing you can do is make no decision make a decision if it's the wrong one you'll learn better to learn and not do it again than to just do nothing and learn nothing um and I learned about accountability without authority and how much that sucks when I was drum major in of the band in high school and like so I think I think I was always I don't know my my childhood nickname was the cruise director like from five at a theme park I had to hold the map make the decisions about where we were going like I just kind of I was always kind of a bossy kid so thank yeah. you wonderful questions awesome well, thank you, Hannah. I uh, appreciate, appreciate everybody's questions. Uh, and real quick, before we adjourn, I do want to give a big shout out uh, to our volunteers, Jen, Emily, Julie, Nisa. Uh, this one's volunteers. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to shout out, we uh, actually have our speaker lined up for next year, which is rare, and she's here. So Kathy Rivers will be our speaker in March. So hi. Um, and Kathy's longtime radio personality in Tucson and current executive director of um, KXCI. So we're really excited to have her um, on the theme of Ripple. Um, so creativemornings.com, nice. make sure you're, you're part of that community and you're on our email list so you can get information for that. And full transparency, I'm a, a full disciple of the Circus of Hannah. So <laughs> know that when uh, for next month. <laughs> huge fan oh, I'm a huge fan too I will be there awesome and then uh, as usual I like to leave you all with a quote uh, I wish as well as everybody else to be perfectly happy but like everybody else it must be in my own way from Jane Austen so go, go be your divergent selves agreed yeah and if anybody would like to continue chatting offline you're welcome to use the form on my website or here's my email um i know not everybody likes to talk in a group so i like new connections so if you're lonely and want to chat reach out also just a reminder too we are a network so if you have your instagram handles on there or um, whatever you can always use the creative mornings website to reach out to one another great all right thanks everyone have a good day hi everybody